Hi, Kirby. Hey, John, how are you? I'm okay. I've never done this on my phone before. I thought I'd see how it works. We've got your audio, no video. I know. I'm standing. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I'm, your audio is on. I think I'm going to switch to my computer. I think this is pretty awful on here. I'll be right back. All right. I can figure out how to leave. Danny, I believe your audio is still muted. There yeah. You yeah, I was just waiting on a minute. Okay. Hey, Michael. Yeah, I'm here. Well, it looks like we have a quorum. Jason or Chris, y'all are y'all expecting Rick to join us? Yeah, he should be okay. on here. Don't see him yet. He's on his way in now. Excellent. Are you the new honorary chair, Mr. Hutto? Temporary honorary chair. <laughs> Temporary honorary, okay. I think I was drafted to this position because of our, our, our previous chair's untimely demise. <laughs> that sounds tragic. Hello. Hey, Mike. All right, I guess as soon as Rhett gets here, we'll get started. Yeah, we probably need him, huh? And there he is. All right, I guess since everyone's here and we have a quorum, we'll go ahead and call this one to order. And the first item on the agenda is the approval of minutes from last month. Anybody have questions or discussion? I'll move to approve. And do we have a second? Second. Second. Sorry. All right, any discussion? And all in favor of approving the October minutes, say aye. 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 All right, then moving to the next item, the new garage update. Rick, is that on yours, your to-do list? Uh, I don't know. Chris, do you want to do this or you want me to talk? Sorry. 
we could probably do it together. Um, you want to kick it off? Sure. Um, the uh, process that we briefed to everybody at the last meeting is essentially unchanged. We are still in the midst of working on putting together an RFQ and then an RFP with Kim Lee Horn. Um, we in fact had an update meeting with the city team today. And we were just talking about how to make those deadlines and uh, what information needed to be included. Uh, probably you'll wanna hear about the uh, CIP meeting with city council. I don't know how many of you saw that, but I think uh, Chris did an excellent job of explaining the project and essentially talking about the approval that we already went through last year to actually kick this project off and get it moving. Uh, Jake, I think you had some, some questions about this. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I, there, it's just seemed like a lot happened uh, last week between the, the couple different meetings and the memo, which I did track down and read, but um, I mean, I kind of just to start with, just wondered if we could sort of all get on the same page about where all that stands. I was, I was, I think probably like I was probably not alone in being a little surprised um, to hear the uh, to hear Lisa Robertson say that the city council could just sort of change or disregard the zoning on the site and and do. <laughs> whatever it wants. <laughs> um, I, so I thought that, that was interesting. I hadn't heard that before. Uh, and I think it's probably fair to say some members of the planning commission seem surprised too. So I, you know, you all know more about this than we do though. So I. Yeah, I, I can, I can chime in. Go ahead. Um, and just give you a little overview of, of the memo that was the discussion of the CIP meeting by and large to kind of brief the council last week. Um, uh, the, the interim city manager, John Blair, asked uh, based upon some, some concerns by a couple of counselors, some questions, um, if we could do a little analysis of the potential to, to build more than just a parking garage, which we and our, our current internal city group, along with our, our consulting engineer, had, had considered last year uh, before going to the council and uh, recommending moving forward with a standalone city-owned facility. Um, but we went and put a little more detail into that and, and put, to, put a memo together that was the basis of some of that discussion you heard last week um, at the CIP meeting, if you were, if you were tuned into that. And, and that was kind of an effort to take a rough look at uh, what it would cost to build uh, the superstructure infrastructure, if you will, to do something at a later date. In fact, uh, Mr. Blair's question was very specific in that given the time constraints of the overall project with the uh, partnership with the courts, county and the, and the courts project that, um, you know, timing is, is of the essence uh, in terms of getting something built. He was not interested in jeopardizing that in any way, but what wanted to consider the idea of could you retroactively uh, seek or seek or get a, a rezoning or a special use permit to build something above the by right use uh, amount? Um, could you do that? And could you build in the infrastructure to support that provided you were successful and build something at a later date? So that was the analysis of the memo. Um, uh, that, the, that the memo undertook and, it, and essentially outlined some of those costs, estimates all um, uh, for, for those costs in conjunction with our engineer um, that's on board to help us with, with the project. You know, the ultimate costs for it wouldn't, wouldn't be known until a design is, is put together and then priced out and then actually built. Um, but we were able to put together some rough estimates to give the council a sense of do you want to do this? Do you not want to do this? Um, the, the outcome of that conversation was, um, you know, some, some questions, some Q&A back and forth, uh, but ultimately given, given where the city is with its overall capital improvement program and the, the potential needs, which I believe I heard um, referenced at slightly over $200 million over five years with the capacity to do about $50 million 
uh, and stay within our financial policies over that same period of time, I think I have those numbers right, uh, you know, presents uh, a situation where adding even a small amount uh, in the grand scheme of things, $5 million, to be able to build above a facility in the future um, didn't seem to be something there was a great deal of interest in. So uh, as, as the team discussed today, uh, when we meet weekly, um, you know, we're, we're continuing to move forward with the project, as Rick, Rick mentioned, uh, the RFQs being written now and intended to go out um, next month and uh, pr proceeding from there to try and meet the schedule of um, 2023 in service uh, date. Can I add something for Jake? Um, City Council can override any design, any plan if they want to. So that for instance, I was on the BAR when the Merit was built on, um, on um, West Main and we did not approve the way it was built. Uh, there was a lot of controversy about it. And at that time, um, uh, Fuji was the city planner and he wanted it a different way than what we approved and city council just went along and did whatever the heck they wanted and it didn't matter what we recommended. So the recommendations only go so far and anybody can appeal to city council and likewise city council can always override any design if they want to. Okay. Yeah. I mean, th so the reason I asked, I mean, one reason I asked was, um, look, I know the, I know the garage in a, in some sense is kind of a settled matter, but you know, as, as to other uses on the site, like, like multifamily, there, there seems to have been a lot of discussion about, um, the way, th the way the costs pencil out based on different zonings. And so, 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 but, but then, but then if the zoning, if the zoning doesn't matter, then I'm not really sure why, I'm not really sure why we've been hearing about that, you know? Yeah, well, it's not only a matter of the, of the zoning. I think Ms. Robertson was referring to the fact that, uh, as, as Joan just mentioned, you know, ultimately the city council has the final say on, on things, BAR, planning commission, or advisory, and if the city owns the property and the city wanted to, to, to see it be a school or a tower or you know whatever, um, it ultimately could. I, I think that um, it's probably poor public policy to, to ignore kind of the rules um, as, as your local government, and which is probably what you're reacting to in terms of when you, when you heard that. Um, so I, I don't know that Ms. Robertson was suggesting that it would just be a, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna go ahead and and build it as high as we want it or what have you. Um, but that ultimately, I think what she was saying was ultimately it could be, you know, reason anything could, could happen within the purview of, of the city council. Um, I think the planning commission and others would be reluctant to, to zone a, a single property into a different district, um, you, you know, without a great deal of thought. That's typically not, not thought to be to be good planning. And uh, I, would, I would tend to agree with that. I, I think the, the concept of the rezoning is, is a little bit of a, a moot point, given the fact that you can do a, a special use permit on any site and on that site, and it, and it gets you essentially um, the same parameters as a, as a rezoning to, to a different district to the downtown extended district does anyway. Uh, virtually the same height. Um, and of course, you, the setbacks are the real challenge on this site. So so you would certainly, um, you know, seek to through a special use permit get some relief from the setbacks as well as additional height so that you could do something else. Um, so the zoning is one piece, or, or the special use permit is one piece, but the other real piece is cost and and, and cost not only in, in hard cost but um, the cost of time. And given the constraints of the agreement with the county, we're we're pretty well boxed in in a lot on a lot of sides, uh, leaving. Uh, not a great deal of, of options. I wish it were different. Uh, you know, we, we tend to advocate for building out the, the envelope as much as possible, whenever possible. Um, but in this case, it, it, the constraints of that site and, and, the, and the timing make it, make it a real challenge. Um, and, and I'm sorry, I don't wanna belabor this in this venue, but um, I wish it were different too, so thanks. Did, so did goal, anybody else goal. have anything about the Seventh Street that they wanted to, that they weren't clear on? Is the goal still to get 300 spaces out of that um, 
that project? The feasibility study that, that we asked to start this process showed the possibility of getting as many as I believe it was 310 spaces. Okay. Uh, I, I think that would be tough, but let's see what, what creative designs we get and we'll see what, what people come up with. All right, any other discussion about the uh, 7th Street project right now? In that case, I guess we can move on the agenda to the um, enforcement. Any updates on that front? Um, I might say as full disclosure, this is one of my favorite topics. Uh, <laughs> I showed up here with the idea of putting parking meters in on the streets to increase turnover on the streets surrounding the mall so that in fact we would have more customer parking. Uh, that for a variety of reasons didn't happen. Uh, we do still have time restrictions on those spaces. Uh, I believe if we had more consistent parking enforcement that uh, in fact people would only stay two hours or less in the two hour spaces. And in effect, we'd get the same thing that the real objective of the parking meters was, which was to get turnover and to get more spaces available for people to park. Um, I think it's difficult with the police being solely responsible for this function, for them to focus on that as a matter of very much importance given all the other issues that they realistically face every single day. Uh, so a great way I think to supplement that is if we went to contract enforcement. Um, and thus, we've been talking about this for about a year and, uh, and I do have a draft RFP in place um, if uh, the powers that be found that it ought to be released and advertised. If this panel would support that and make those wishes known, maybe we could move the needle forward. Yeah, I have a couple. I have a couple questions. Um, I read over the RFP that you sent after our last meeting, and I mean, I am certainly supportive of moving parking enforcement um, to some other enforcement agency, I guess, um, I have two questions. One is, you know, what is the reason or what's the reason why it's advantageous to contract this out uh, versus having city staff perform this uh, enforcement function? Um, and then my other question is on relate on related to this with the the parking meter um, pilot. And I know we discussed this a little bit last week. But I'm wondering, you know, where is where is the sticking point with that? You know, why? That perhaps this is my um, just lack of knowledge of the issue, but I know it's complicated. But you know, what is where where is this stuck? And you know, I would be interested in and in seeing what this panel can do to, you know, support the the parking meters. So those are my questions on. The issue. Rick, do you want to answer that or do you want me to? Well, I'm going to take the first one and I had planned to hand you the second one. Um, the, you, you virtually cannot find a, a larger city in the United States that does not delegate parking enforcement to contractors. Um, now, the primary reason that they do that is because of costs and flexibility. Um, if you notice in the RFP, it goes to considerable lengths that the parking enforcement officers are not just police light, that in fact, they're ambassadors for the city and provide more of a function than simply writing parking tickets. And that they are uh, trained and designed in terms of their uniforms, their manner, and everything as non-confrontational. Nobody likes getting a parking ticket, but these folks are 
are trained and as I said, uniformed and the culture is one of a lack of confrontation and de-escalation. Um, the other thing is flexibility. Um, this RFP talked about a very limited number of officers in a very limited area of uh, the city, but that could easily be expanded with contractors by adding more staff to, for instance, manage uh, parking tickets in the residential areas where we have a permit system. And I think there's a fair number of residents that aren't very happy about a lack of enforcement of these permits that they go to all the trouble to buy and put on their cars, but other people still park in front of their house without one. Um, so there's an ability to both increase or shrink the workforce when, it's, when it is a contractor force that is much simpler than working with any city employees um, who it may be difficult to recruit, train, and there's a certainly a greater reluctance in layoffs. So I think those are the two primary things, the ability to control how the officers act and the ability to, uh, for the workforce to be flexible. Now, <laughs> why did the meters fail? The meters <laughs> were a concept that was put through um... Mark Brown, who was one of the previous people that was running the parking garages, put through that um, idea and got some support for it. There was not universal support from the downtown businesses. The meters were put in and scheduled to go in September of 2017. And the week after Heather Heyer was killed on 4th Street, the city started drilling to put in the parking meters, which raised a huge outcry. At that point, the businesses downtown were suffering. There was people not wanting to come downtown. There was fear of coming downtown. And when the meters went in, there was like, it, it was like the worst publicity for downtown you could have had. People were totally upset. The businesses were upset. People were like, I'm never coming back downtown if you're going to put meters in. And it created quite an uproar, which um, some of us on this committee um, fought very hard to get those meters taken out. They were taken out temporarily when we knew they were never coming back. To put them back in would, it's again, we're in an era of um, downtown is suffering economically, and it would be detrimental to the businesses. There would be a huge outcry, and I think Rick would not want to have to live through another one of these episodes, I think. <laughs> It was not really fun for him. Hey, no problem. I'm ready. Yeah. Hey. If you'll support it, Joan, I'll get him back in. I'm, uh, you know where I am on that one, and I will do everything to get them out of there. The other thing is we had gotten the city to allocate, I think they allocated $90,000 for us to have ambassadors downtown and insisted that they run that program. They hired um, people who were inappropriate for that position, who were retirees who sort of walked the mall and did not do anything to be an ambassador. And so the hope is that this funding would also give us ambassadors. Right now we have CSOs that do the ticketing when they're available, and some of them are not always pleasant. Um, so, And I'm sorry about that meter going off. But they can be rude and difficult, and we have no control over that. So when somebody comes to downtown and they get their ticket and try to fight it and say, I'm just running inside, um, some people are not happy with the way they've been approached on it. And so that turns off potential customers. So if there is a contract with a firm and we have some say over how they get trained, how they behave, it would be much better so that we had absolutely no say on the training for those previous ambassadors and it was a joke really the way it was implemented by the city so i think the feeling is that there would be better control and every study shows that if you actually have a turnover in your parking the value to business is well worth that um you know there, there's a value put to each parking spot if it's being available for customers and what currently happens is either people do a two-hour shuffle or we found that there's a huge amount of city employees. The piece that we always push is that if we're going to do this and it's difficult now to do the two-hour shuffle, 
what can the city do to help provide parking for employees? And that's the piece that we keep asking for as part of a comprehensive package. I think the other thing is just, we have not had consistent enforcement ever. Right. I mean, it'll come, come up, there'll be you know public comment about it and you'll get a month of enforcement and then the police are pulled off and are given something else to focus on. And uh, I mean, right now, if you go over on Monticello Avenue, there are two cars that have been there for weeks that are covered in leaves. No one has, there's no tickets. No one has enforced it. It's an eight hour spot, but they're tied up. You know, I don't know if those cars are, are even functional. I mean, one of them doesn't look like it, but again, it's just, you know, without consistent enforcement, people learn to take advantage and to just ignore the signs. And uh, that's bad for downtown because then those spaces are not in rotation. And I think that um, taking that away from the police, giving it to contract enforcement that has a sole purpose, well, in addition to the ambassador focus, but I think just you know, getting that consistent enforcement of the two hour spaces um, it's, it's just critical. And that's something that, that uh, I don't see it happening with the police or with city employees in the short term, given the, uh, the budget constraints. And Rick, I believe that the concept here is that this is going to be almost self-funding, correct? Yeah. My experience in other places and from talking to other people is typically the cost of the patrol by the officers is offset at four or five times by the revenue generated from fines. And then again, you know, looking at the bigger picture, if we're getting four or five times the cost, those are funds that are now available to support other parking initiatives to make sure that we always have well-managed inventory in this, the business districts that require it. And I think we have to always, I know there's really no one here who's dedicated to West Main, but West Main is another neighborhood where parking is a huge crunch. And, uh, you know, it's not just downtown. It, it, it really is something that we need to be looking at the whole city on. So I think that this is a good step to professionalize and provide consistency. And I've been in favor of it since we've had the initial discussions. And the other piece is we talked about not having it be enforced right at two hours, that there's a little bit of leeway there. It's not like you come in at nine and at 11, you're ticketed, you know, that you have- We set the policy, it can right. be whatever you like. Very commonly, if it's two hour parking, you would patrol the area every two and a half hours. So that typically people at least have a half hour leeway. I'm sorry, I'm a little confused about, I mean, is the idea to have more enforcement or less enforcement? Because it seems like, it seems like I'm hearing that people want there to be more turnover so there are, are parking spaces available. But, but at the same time, I feel like the best way to be really rigorous about this would be to have parking meters. And I'm also hearing that people didn't like the rigorousness of that. So. Oh. I mean, what, what are we, what is, what is the change? I'm, I'm all for having the police less involved in people's lives personally, but um, like so, what, is, what exactly is the change in, in enforcement that we're looking for here? Well, we're gonna enforce free two hour parking. So the first two hours are free. It's not a meter that you have to feed, but right now there's no enforcement. So it becomes 12 hour parking. It becomes a 12 hour space and you know, People just laugh at the signs. Um, I think this also plays into the other things we've talked about as far as uh, you know, temporary parking um, closures for construction or you know, for us at the pavilion. Um, you know, there's a lot that a, an outside contractor could do a better job than what we have seen over the past few years. Um, in addition to you know, saving the city some money and also generating funds to support other initiatives that are gonna, gonna make sure that we always have plenty of good parking. 
I think part of it too is like I used to be on Second Street, okay? So you knew all of a sudden they would start patrolling and all of a sudden parking spots would free up. And for a week or two, people didn't abuse it. They weren't in the loading zones. They would do whatever. And then once somebody discovers they don't get parking, they don't get a ticket, they are there every day, the same 10 cars taking the full spot. The trucks can't unload. People that want to park and run into Christians to get pizza or run in to get some coffee or whatever it is can't do that. So it's detrimental to business when people park all day. So the concept is simply how do you open up those spaces so they're available to anybody who legitimately has two hours of business to do. And if they're going to do more than that, you're encouraging them to go to the garages. The meters become, um, everybody's used to the two-hour parking. The meters become a, um, a like a penalty. Well, the, the meters also, can you guys hear me because I'm... Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, the uh, the meters had this effect, uh, you know, first of all, there was no grace period. Part of it was implementation. There was no grace period. So if you wanted to run into Market Street Market for, you know, a dollar twenty nine little quart of milk, it cost you an hour of parking. Um, so there was no, say, 15 minutes free. The meters themselves, I think a lot of people struggled with because they weren't meters at every spot and there weren't, you know, codes. They weren't smart meters. So th they were sort of um, difficult for technophobes and older folks, but also not nearly um, sort of workable enough for, you know, the, the folks who are ready to do everything on their smartphone and just, you know, pay from their pay for their parking, you know, while they're at lunch, an alert would come up, you know, the, it didn't have that technology either. So it was, um, there was some implementation issues. And it was also right after um, the downtown had just taken a hit. So there was that timing, like, hey, can we, can we delay this six months? People are not coming downtown. They have this perception that everywhere you go, there are Nazis with AK-47s. So were the meters implemented for a period of time and then removed, or were they just not implemented? They were implemented, mm -hmm. and it was bad. For about 61 <laughs> days. Mm -hmm. yeah, was, uh, for 61 days, and then they remained in place, and we suspended the program for the holidays for Thanksgiving through the 1st of January, and then the program was restarted on January 1, and then it was shut down permanently at midnight on January 1, when the uh, city council meeting concluded at midnight, I'm sorry, January 2, the day after New Year's. Uh, it was shut down and the meters were then removed over time. Uh, the, uh, we tried two different meters simultaneously to try to get feedback on what people wanted. One of them was pay stations with one of them on each block where you entered your license plate number to identify which vehicle had paid. The other spaces were with individual parking meters that were smart meters. They took credit cards, they took coins, and they did have variable amounts of time that you could park for. Uh, we also started a mobile payment system. It also started on January 2 at 8 o'clock in the morning and ended with the meters at midnight on January 2. So there wasn't much experience of folks with the mobile payment system. Uh, the enforcement was by CSOs. Yeah. And I think that's what Joan was referring to they, they were not necessarily acting like parking enforcement ambassadors, but were acting more like police officers. And so on top of the meters and the bad feelings associated with the Unite the Right rally, um, it, there was just a lot of negative feelings going on simultaneously. I think just to add to the original question, I think Mr. Mooney stated, you know, meters versus enforcement. 
the, the purpose of either um, is the same, to create that turnover that um, Joan alluded to in terms of the business wants turnover. We, we want to see turnover so that there, there's opportunity for additional shopping and, and retail and visitation and things, things of that nature. When you ask somebody to pay, that forces turnover in, its, in one way. Um, when, when you give somebody a ticket, that forces turnover. So uh, right now the meters aren't in place. Uh, Rick made a comment earlier about, you know, you go to any medium large kind of city and you have uh, outsourced enforcement, pretty typical. You also have meters. Um, it, it, it's hard to find a city that doesn't have meters anymore. Um, so we don't have the meters and we don't have consistent enforcement at the moment. Um, so th they, they both tackle the same issue in, in slightly different ways. And um, I think we've realized that the, the timing was awful, obviously, on, on the, the original attempt at meters and, um, you know, going with a, a more consistent enforcement idea at this point seems to be a palatable route for, you know, businesses, residents, everybody, um, at, at least at this point. So, Rick, what was the impediment to getting the RFP actually approved and issued? Is it, is it Chief Brackney? Is it council? Um, I'll answer that one, Kirby. It, 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 it's a little bit of all of the above. Uh, you know, this, this was, was originally, shoot Rick, this probably written over a year ago, maybe more. Yeah. Uh, when, we, when we started uh, kind of talking about it and, and spending time on it, we had a city manager transition um, at that time. Uh, we had a police chief transition just prior to that. And so there was a little bit of, well, let's let them get, you know, in their seats and let's uh, give them a little time to, to know the community before we, you know, ask for permission for a major change, <laughs> such, such as something like this. Well, everybody knows the situation now. We have another transition. We have an interim city manager. Uh, we have the same police chief. Uh, that hasn't changed. Um, there is some reluctance on the part of the police department to, to have, and I think if I can characterize it, um, the concern is, you know, what happens when an enforcement officer um, gives a ticket erroneously and that needs to be appealed? Um, the, the citizen is naturally going to knock on the police department door because they expect or think that that's where it came from. And it creates kind of a situation where there's, you know, people going to the wrong place, complaining to the wrong, wrong person, you know, could be some confusion there. Um, so that's, that's one of the uh, concerns that the police department has with with delegating it to, to, to another group. And obviously those are operational details that can and have been worked out in other places. Um, but we haven't gotten to the point where, you know, we, we've had that opportunity here. Hey, Kirby, <laughs> um, what, what did you mean by other initiatives on West Main Street? Um, I mean, there's been talk of uh, finding a, a space for a garage or additional parking, because if the West Main Improvement Project goes through as designed, there's going to be a, a net loss of parking, you know, that complete length of West Main. And I think, um, you know, the businesses there, like many of the businesses downtown, need to have patron parking. Not all of their patrons are going to arrive um, by bicycle or walking or mass transit. And you've all, you know, it's just, it's, it's something where, you know, the, I think the parking plan when it was, was laid out was trying to come up with a way to, to keep, parking would not be an, a cost to the city. It would be something that generated revenue and by managing inventory of parking spaces better over time, it would be self-supporting and it would, you know, not just self-supporting from a financial model, but also supportive of the business community and, and its needs. And I think that, uh, you know, just having on-street spaces that are not managed properly just is not really working for us right now. So I see out farming out enforcement as something that's sort of a natural next step in the process. Um, you know, if it leads to bringing back a discussion of meters in five years, so be it. But in the meantime, at least we're going to try to better manage the inventory that we have so that it's meeting the needs of, of the, uh, of the community. 
So that's that's sort of my philosophical take on it. Yeah, and I, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I just wanted to clarify, but I mean, from maybe Rick or Chris, like from the city's perspective, I mean, <laughs> nah, it, if we support this RFP, are are we that are we sort of giving a baby step of support to building a garage on West Main Street, or are those different things? Uh, I think those are different things. I mean, Kirby alludes to the fact that the West Main Street streetscape plan, which has been in the public purview for many years and is partially funded but not fully funded at this point, um, does remove 33 spaces from the street uh, to make room for bike lanes and bump outs and bus stops and things of that nature. So when the council approved that, they approved it with the caveat that, okay, in the meantime, while we try and get this funding, we'd, we'd like to have a parking solution that at least replaces those spaces and potentially creates opportunity for, you know, the corridor to grow and build out. Um, that problem hasn't been solved. Uh, real estate on West Main is challenging. Um, we've looked into, you know, some possible partner opportunities. Uh, the city owns a parking lot there behind the yellow old Albemarle Hotel. Uh, we looked at having that kind of, uh, you know, a one or two or three story deck kind of fitting in there. It's not ideal. It backs up to a park. It's a squirrely weird site and certainly not efficient. Um, we've talked to some of the developments along the st uh, street that have potentially excess parking um, to varying degrees of uh, willingness to, to partner with the city, depending on the timing and and anyway, we haven't pulled the trigger on any of those because uh, funds are limited and there really isn't a need at the moment. But suffice it to say, um, the council was the council that did approve the West Main Street streetscape wanted a parking solution uh, to at least take care of the 33 spaces that were going to be lost and potentially and potentially more. Whether that's a new garage or just kind of a, a surface lot or some kind of partnership with a private development was yet to be determined. But I think any of those options become easier if there is a pot of money dedicated to parking at some point in the future. Our money's good. Well, so our, what, would, would what's our goal of having this item on the agenda today? Are, are we looking for a, a, a vote of, of of support from the, this panel, or um, do we want to just let it ride for a while until we get a new city manager in effect? I, I'm not sure what our what our purpose is for for having this discussion for the fifth or sixth time. Someone we'll be reaching out to Chief Crackney at this point. You know, it, it probably wouldn't hurt if if a couple of you were interested in doing that. Um, we have not raised the issue in recent months, um, and I think to Kirby's point. It, it, I think at one point this panel did did vote uh, to, to support the notion. Uh, if I'm wrong, correct me if I'm wrong on that, Rick, but I, I'm pretty sure at, at some point that, that was addressed. Um, you know, given the transition we're in right now, I'm not sure it really helps to, to do it again at the moment. Uh, I think just having you all aware, realizing there's a number of new members uh, was part of the purpose, but uh, you know, and, and hearing thoughts on it. I don't know if, if everybody would fully support it or not, but just kind of getting a sense of where the panel would be. And if, if there's some outreach that any of you as individuals would like to make, um, that's, probably, that's probably fine too. Personally, I think politically, it's a good time to try to present again, as people are asking to rethink how the police are, what jobs the police are needed to do and not to do. And I think it's worth, reminding the city that we're recommending this if we have support from this group. Um, I realize, I think we could be in transition for a long time. Yeah, it seems like we're- And, and just to put it off because of that, I, I just feel like, um, you know, it would take months to get this in, in place. And, you know, if we can have this starting in the spring in hopes that um, the timing would be good on that. Um, I think we should raise the issue again with council. I think there may be an openness to it. I'm inclined to agree with you completely on that. I'd, you know, I'd like to make a motion that we ask council again to consider this. Um, if we think that there's a point in reaching out to Brackney. 
somebody's welcome to try that, but you know, um, I don't think that she's going to support it necessarily, but I think that the council would. I will say that if we advertise the RFP tomorrow, it is many months before we will be able to be active. We've got to give good 30 days at least for people to respond to the RFP. We've got got to evaluate proposals and who's got the best one. We've got to get a contract signed with them. Then they have to recruit people and train people before we're going to allow them to actually do anything. So this is easily a six month process if we started today. And, and just to be clear, they recruit from Charlottesville. Oh, this, yeah. this, this provides. Uh, they, well, they, they'd be paying a living wage. We'd be paying folks $15 an hour. And quite frankly, that's not real easy to find anybody right now for $15 an hour. Uh, it, uh, it can be, um, it can be the kind of work that's not a lot of fun. You don't write tickets and have people like you. Uh, it, it rains. It snows, it's unpleasant walking around outside looking at cars. Um, so, but uh, the, the, the good news is it doesn't require any particular education. You need to be trained on what the law is to write the ticket, but you don't require any sort of computer skills other than what you can be fairly easily trained to use a handheld ticketing device. Um, so those are kind of the pluses and minuses. And, it, and sometimes it's not that easy to find good people to be ambassadors. There might be somebody who wants the job because he likes writing parking tickets for people, but that's not necessarily who you want to hire. Um, so there, there, there's a lot of that to getting good people to do this job. And we're going to we're going to have control over what those standards are. I think that's absolutely. The yeah. And the other nice thing about having it as a contractor, if somebody has complaints against them, this doesn't become a long personnel issue. I simply as the uh, contract manager, say, uh, John is uh, not working out. He needs to be moved to another contract. He can't work on the city contract anymore, period. So typically what's written in here is that uh, the city has the ability to uh, remove any individual from the contract without cause. All right, well, I heard Joan make a, a motion. Do we have a second on that? Second to the motion to bring this up to council again now and not wait for our perpetual transition to be over. I second. Okay. This, I'm sorry, this is a motion to ask council to consider this again? That's that correct. Yes. As a first step to get the ball rolling. Any additional discussion or other questions about moving forward on, on trying to get this RFP process rolling. Just, just as a practical matter, um, you all are perfectly uh, able to request the council take a look at it. But what we would do is have a conversation with the interim city manager uh, to see if it's appropriate for an agenda or what his recommended next step would be, which may be a conversation with council at a council meeting, uh, or it may be something different. So just so you're aware that that's the action that we would take next. Okay, well, I guess, but the, the motion from Joan is to try to jumpstart this process. Is that correct, Joan? Yes, I would say my motion is that we uh, again address the issue and ask the city to consider it in whatever manner Jason and Chris think is appropriate. All right, other discussion? Well, just to reiterate, it does seem like we're just always in transition. So I don't think that we 
I don't think that waiting until the dust settles is a good idea because the dust doesn't seem to want to settle. Anyone else? All right, then we have a motion and a second to push the RFP for um, contract enforcement. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, the motion passes unanimously. Chris and Jason and Rick, the ball's in your court. Please keep us posted as things move forward. And let us know if any of us can help in any way, please. Will do. Um, next item on the agenda, let me get it back up here. Introduce the parking action plan. The uh, parking action plan was actually drafted and uh, approved before my hire. Um, and one of, the, one of the action items on the plan was to develop a parking division and get somebody to run it, uh, which is what was accomplished. Uh, I think, Chris, you might correct me, but the action plan was essentially the reiteration of most of the important points from the Nelson Nygaard parking study and what their recommendations were as to how the city of Charlottesville might begin to, to manage public parking in a uh, systematic way. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, that's the origin of it. So we, so the city did that. And I, I was actually really impressed by the parking action plan. And it's one of the reasons that I accepted this position because I thought that it was well balanced and uh, hit the most important points for any public parking system. And it essentially said, we're not gonna look at one solution or one action is gonna fix public parking. Instead, we're, we're gonna look at this and approach it from multi-directions. And one of them was to start with, was to make the best use of the resources you have. And I think we've done that with uh, the uh, change in contractor who's operating both the Water Street and Market Street garages. I think that the new contractor has been much more responsive to the city. And I think the city is now truly operating those garages for the benefit of the city solely. Um, and so I think we are maximizing what resources we currently have. One way to, to increase that would be, for instance, to put meters back in, but that's not, that's not a make or break. Another thing is to um, obtain um, consistent parking enforcement, which is what you've been talking about for quite a while today. Um, so that's, that's one approach. Another approach is let's add to parking supply when it's necessary by looking at what the demand is, looking at how we can add more public parking supply that would encourage and support economic development. I think parking within economic development is the perfect place because I've always thought of public parking as a tool of economic development. We don't create parking for the sake of parking. We create parking so that people can get to businesses as employees, as customers, and so the businesses can grow. Um, we have uh, tried to do that. We're doing that, for instance, right now in the uh, construction of the new 7th Street garage. We are growing the parking supply to meet the needs of the courts. And at the same time, looking at adding a modest number of spaces so that for instance, we could move all the city employees out of Water Street and Market Street, get them out of those two garages right next door to the mall 
to make more room for mall employees and mall customers and get those people into the new 7th Street garage. So I think that's that's a way that we are we we have looked in the past at how we could partner with developers. I believe uh, Chris was working on that for a number of years with the West Second Street project. Um, it unfortunately did not come to fruition. Although as an aside, I've done four mixed use development projects with garages and residential buildings. Every one of them took at least a year to negotiate. And one of them, four years later, fell apart, very similarly to West Second. Not because it was anyone's fault, but it's difficult to have a developer be able to prove in a pro forma that whatever it's going to get built is actually profitable enough to get anyone to invest in the in the structure. And they're difficult to get through the entire uh, planning process, approval process. That was one of the things that fell apart back in Maryland on the project there. Similarly, it happened on the West Second Street project here. So West Second was not unusual. That's very common, unfortunately, and just shows how difficult these mixed use ventures can be. But it was an attempt by the city to partner and, I'm, and we will continue to look for ways to partner. Um, so I guess we're coming back to you because the parking action plan had uh, a number of objectives we've completed it had, it was a five year plan and those five years expired. And we're looking at this panel to tell us what stuff do you think ought to be added to this? These are goals for the future and these are ways of, of addressing improving public parking. So the, we're kind of looking for this panel's ideas on what needs to be added, what things we can just remove from it because they've been accomplished, and uh, what the next five-year plan ought to be. Is that a good summary? Yeah, that's a good summary, Rick. And I think just to, to put everybody at ease, the time's running short today. This is not intended to be an activity for today, but just to introduce it, to introduce the notion that um, actually some of you will remember Pre-COVID, we, we had raised this and we had a plan in place to have, I think, the next three meetings, um, probably the, the first three that we missed once COVID struck, um, with guest speakers to come and kind of offer insight. So the um, uh, Charlottesville Area Transit Director, Garland Williams, was invited. He was going to come talk about trends in transit. Um, I think we were going to have Brennan Duncan, the transportation engineer, come and talk about changes to the street network, things of that nature. I think we also had maybe Amanda Ponce, bike ped coordinator, uh, maybe even Chip Boyles, uh, PDC director uh, for kind of a regional view on things like that. So we were gonna kind of tee up for the panel to hear from and be able to ask questions of some of these local experts um, to kind of uh, trigger some thinking and some thoughts that might find their way in kind of a revised parking action plan. So, you know, I think what we want you to think about is who are those people if they're different than the ones I just mentioned? Um, uh, are there others that, that would be interesting to hear from? Is there some kind of research that you need us to kind of guide you to to better understand, you know, trends in, in, in parking or, or traffic and things of, of that nature that would help? And then we can set out over the next couple of meetings, likely virtually, uh, to have these guest speakers come and talk and um, and then we can kind of start to you know make some progress on a, on an updated plan so that that was the thinking just to kind of plant the seed and have you all start to think about that so that we can arrange some future conversations that sounds great um, you don't need direction from us to start making those plans though do you not no, necessarily, but it would, you know, if you have ideas, you know, share them either now or, or via email over the next um, month as we set up another agenda, and we, we can take it from there. 
I guess one, one thing that would be helpful for the context, the overall context, is to talk about the various projects that we know are in the works that are going to affect a significant number of parking place spaces, either positively or negatively. You know, certainly Belmont Bridge, West Main Streetscape, um, the redevelopment of the, um, is it called Garrett Street or Levy Street over there, this, the, where all the city employees park now that's going to be developed into, into yeah. public housing. I think just understanding where those are and what's the impact of each of them would really be helpful. Mm -hmm. Okay. I can do a white paper for everybody, just kind of summarizing where each of these projects are and what their effect on the parking supply is going to be. Anyone else have ideas now of directions or suggestions for, um, for topics as we dive into that? And if, if we don't have them now, I think we can certainly email to Rick at any point. Absolutely. I, I have a question. It, it's, I don't know, if, <laughs> if the answer is too long or if it's too philosophical, we could take it offline, but um, the, the, the expression maintaining and growing supply, um, you know, is, is, that, is that a given? Um, I mean, I, I, it's, I was having a conversation with someone about this uh, and, and I think if, you know, a lot of what we do sort of flows from that, from having that as a goal. Um, and, and the person I was talking to pointed it out to me that it's that the growing part doesn't actually appear in the, in the Nelson Nygaard study. Um, yeah, I think it says maintain and monitor. Um, somehow monitor turned into growing. Um, and I, I was surprised uh, to hear that. And I just wondered, you know, I mean, is everything on the table with this? Uh, or are there cer certain things that are sort of um, not flexible? Uh, I don't, the, let's, let's uh, go back to the, to the growing part. Um, the only thing that we're growing would be the Seventh Street garage, uh, and and I think that the the demand for that is based on the fact that we were having to close the Market Street garage at least one day a week for an hour or two hours a day and turn people away because it was full. Um, so that certainly gave us the indication that adding another 50 parking spaces in close proximity to Market Street seemed like a good idea. Uh, so I think monitoring we were doing by, by checking the utilization of the garages, which is actually posted online now, and it was demonstrating that uh, that more parking might be helpful. Now, long term, that's not a given at all. If modes of transportation can change, if we can find ways to get more people out of single occupancy vehicle trips, if we can get more housing located near jobs, so there's more biking, more walking, and more ability to have mass transit that works, that's a great thing. And if we can do that, maybe we can drive down parking demand and in fact go the other way and reduce parking supply. So uh, it's a great goal. It's just not what's before us, at least as I see the situation before COVID. Now, after COVID, that's anybody's guess. There are a lot of people throughout the industry, throughout the country, simply throwing up their hands and saying, we don't know. We're just going to have to wait and see. But, but if we're talking about a five-year plan, that, that might be, those might be appropriate things to talk about. 
We certainly, for instance, in a five-year plan, given the, the current, current health pandemic, might specifically address it and say we need to review needs based on um, parking demand after the current health emergency, because it could be very different. It could be different in a, a nearer term than electric vehicles in 20 years. So, I mean, if we're trying to figure out a, a, a mission statement here, I think, I think it's safe to say that pre-COVID uh, supply was inadequate for demand. We saw it that um, way. You know, I think maybe what reduction in spaces, the, right. the spaces going. We, we've over the last ten years, we've lost substantial inventory. Um, you know, so whether you're talking about growing or reclaiming some of that inventory, I think regardless what you're talking about is ensuring that there is adequate inventory for demand. So, you know, that kind of is, is a flexible enough model to change with the changes in demand. Um, but That's I, 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 I think one of the pieces that we've talked about too is the fact that we need to be in the discussion with the bike people and the alternative um, transportation when decisions are made that affect parking so that the parking decisions are not a separate entity but rather when there's a decision being made about putting in a bike route or anything like that parking piece has to be a piece of it with consultation with Rick, our parkings are, or with economic development, you know, that that's a piece that needs to be in there, regardless of which direction things are going. Because I think historically, that has not been the case. And that's where we have had some surprises with the loss of significant numbers of parking spaces where that had just never surfaced as part of the discussion. Um, you know, certainly when we talked about replacing Belmont Bridge, I don't know that anyone expected that that was gonna result in a net loss of 55 parking spaces that, um, you know, a lot of downtown employees use on a regular basis, but, you know, at least as we went through that process, that became a topic of conversation. So it isn't always, growing parking, it's, it is part of that monitoring parking. And then if we see that we're looking at a net loss over the short term, you know, then that may be, you know, then growth might have to be on the table just to maintain the same level of inventory. So I think that that, that monitoring piece is, is sort of the, the key one in my mind. Well, and and that's exactly what you're getting at. Um, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I'm done. I, I was just going to say that's that's exactly back to the Seventh Street Garage. Um, essentially, what we're doing is replacing the ones the the known losses that you referenced: Belmont Bridge, Levy Lot, Water Street Trail, which is already in place, um, the court spaces, which are 90, and then the existing 63 that are on the site now that are part of the inventory. You know, people park there that work downtown, some city, some other. Uh, when you add all those up, you get real close to 300. You leave a few left for the actual building. If it has some commercial space in it, it it's going to need some, some uh, it's going to create a little demand there. And then you're at 300. So you, you can call it monitoring, maintaining, you can call it growing, but you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's a net neutral to the supply, if you will, if all those things occur. Uh, Belmont Bridge is going to happen. The Levy lot is likely to happen, although we've heard that a couple of times before. Yep. But, you know, within five years, I would expect, given that we're seeing movement with the Housing Authority, that it will happen. And um, both of those are pretty big blows. Uh, those are free and um, close. And uh, so to, 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 to ignore those would be, I think, a mistake uh, for, the, for the health and vitality of the downtown. Um, you know, didn't say it in this meeting yet, but the last structured parking space that was built in um, Charlottesville was 28 years ago. Um, we've certainly added population in that time. We've certainly added jobs in that time. 
Um, we've certainly added visitors in that time. And, um, you know, so we, we have to kind of wrestle with that and balance that so that we maintain a healthy, vibrant core, uh, but not certainly not overbuild because it's expensive and we don't know the future. And the future may look a little different 20 years from now uh, with respect to how people get around. Um, it's a little bit of an unknown, but that's something for the group to wrestle with. Well, and Chris, I think I read a quote from you um, relative to the 7th Street that we're thinking Market Street has another 20 years of life in it before that's going to happen. Yeah, and that also plays into the to the dynamic, the conversation of, you know, what what do you do when that happens? And yeah. if you have nothing else, you're really in a pickle. If you have something else, you're only in half a pickle. And, you know, if we build the Market Street parking garage, I mean, excuse me, the 7th Street deck as envisioned with 300 spaces, you know, I would call that half a pickle. Uh, <laughs> you know, to, to carry that out. But yeah, at some point, um, none of us are engineers, um, but the engineers tell us at some point the, the structure fails and it's been well kept. It's nearly 50 years old, um, but it might have 20, it might have 25. It's going to fail at some point, And that means it's out of service for minimum, you know, year or two and gets taken down and then something else gets built. Uh, we don't know what that looks like, but that's going to be a big blow. Um, that deck was built before the downtown mall was rebricked, or was bricked the first time. And uh, looking back in the history of Charlottesville decisions, probably one of the wisest ones <laughs> we, we've seen, because without the parking spaces on the on the street, you know, there needed to be a solution. And 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 they did that first. They didn't wait, do the bricks, and then come back and do it. They did it first. So, yeah. And I would just add that I think the Water Street Garage really was responsible for the um, turnaround in the um, whole mall. That prior to that, places were for rent for $6 a square foot and nobody wanted them. And that garage was really an economic driver for the downtown mall developing. That and the ice skating rink and the movie theater all came in around the same time. Right. And that's when you saw a transition. But the, without the garage, it wouldn't have happened. Well, I think it certainly is time, folks, of time. Uh, we promised Brian we'd be off this call not later than uh, five o'clock. We got 20 minutes and we do still have public comment. Yep, that's, I was trying to wrap things up and just say, let's, let's give you all direction to start setting up um, educational sessions for us uh, so that we can have the background we need to revisit the, the parking plan and to update it for um, for the next five year cycle. Um, any other comments on the parking plan right now or suggestions that we need to give to staff? Well, then the next item on the agenda is public comment. So Brian, are there anyone, anyone in the room that's requesting a chance to comment? Let's find out if you'd like to speak to the parking advisory panel Click the raise hand icon in the Zoom webinar. We have two people in the audience right now, and neither is raising their hand. Okay. Uh, any new business that we need to, to address? Anything that wasn't on the agenda that people want to bring up? I get a sense we're coming to the end of today's meeting then. <laughs> Motion to adjourn. Do we have a second? We have a second. Thank you, everyone. Um, I feel like today was fairly productive, and um, we'll look to see you next month. Thanks, Kirby. All right. In the meantime, I'll get you a plan for the parking uh, action plan for our next meeting. Sounds great. Awesome. All right. Thank you. Thank you all.